Hi, welcome back to CIFCON and Highland, the Highlands Rural Providers. I'm here with Kevin McLaughlin again. It's great to have you back. Second panel we've gotten to do, to, do together. It's been so far. Okay, uh, a little bit about me and my bona fides and what we're going to be talking about today. Highlands Rules for Writers are five rules, five short lines that represent some of the most powerful uh, writing advice ever given. I don't think that there's any set of words that short that have had that large an impact on so many writing careers. So this is really heady stuff. It's also really complicated as well as simple at the same time. So if uh, if anybody has questions, I expect there to probably be questions as I go along. Please answer. Please feel free to ask them, and I will answer as best I can. Uh, I'm watching the comments. Uh, Christine is also here to help me look for comments and questions. So please do uh, uh, ask questions as we go. All right. I'm a multiple USA Today bestselling author of 70 something science fiction and fantasy books. I've lost count, and I need to sit down and recount. I've lost track. Um, and I've been doing this for almost a decade. Uh, it'll be a decade next August when I first published, self published my first stuff. And now I do my own stuff and I do some stuff through publishers. So I kind of mixed it up a little bit. Uh, I also wrote, literally wrote the book on, on this subject. Uh, so if you'd like to, to check out more detail on it, um, you can grab that at pretty much every ebook and print book uh, retailer out there. Back in the 1940s, there was a book published, and I've, I've got a copy here, so we're doing show and tell today a little bit. This is a <laughs> signed <laughs> hardcover first edition of the book where Heinlein's Rules first appeared. Uh, Dean Wesley Smith, a writer I know, introduced me to the rules and introduced me to the, the book, and I immediately went out and had to go buy my own copy. So it's this cute little set of writing advice from a bunch of different authors. And um, Heinlein wrote an essay in it. And he said that, you know, like, I'm told that these articles are supposed to be of some use to the reader. I have a guilty feeling that all of the above may have been more for my amusement than for your edification. Therefore, I shall chuck in as a bonus, a group of practical tested rules, which if followed meticulously, will prove rewarding to any writer. So this is literally like his afterthoughts <laughs> at the very end of his essay but it ended up being the most important part of the whole thing. I shall assume that you can type, that you know the accepted commercial format or can be trusted to look it up and follow it, and that you always use new ribbons and clean type. Also, that you can spell and punctuate and can use grammar well enough to get by. These things are merely the word carpenter's sharp tools. He must add to them these business habits. You must write. You must finish what you start. You must refrain from rewriting except to editorial order. You must put it on the market and you must keep it on the market until sold. The above five rules really have more to do with how to write speculative fiction than anything said above them, but they are amazingly hard to follow, which is why there are so few professional writers and so many aspirants, and which is why I am not afraid to give away the racket. But if you will follow them, it matters not how you write, you will find some editor somewhere, sometimes so unwary or so desperate for copy as to buy the worst old dog you or I or anybody else can throw at them. Okay. So we're going to break down these rules a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> just a little? Yeah, just a little, because there's, there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack. Each of these rules builds on the last. The first one you must write sounds really super obvious, except it's the one that kills more than 90% of all writers. Oh, yeah. uh, all, more than 90% of all would be writers, but at least nine out of 10 people who say they want to write, never actually try writing, never get going with it. So more than anything else, writing is a practice. It, it's something that we need to continuously work on. It's something that we need to continuously improve at and, the way we do that is by practicing, same as any other art. The violinist does not get better by uh, looking at their violin. <laughs> the writer doesn't get better by looking at their keyboard. 
we have to do in order to be able to improve. But it's actually more complicated than that too. As we've grown in our understanding of the human mind, we, we've learned about things like neuroplasticity, which is the way our brains can reshape themselves over time to be able to do different things. Neuroplasticity has a great amount of impact on writing and other arts because writing is part craft and part art. It, it It's exceptionally powerful here. I can't speak about every art because I haven't done all of them. <laughs> but in writing, it's especially powerful because it has aspects of both. The more we write, the more we are telling our minds that um, this is important, that I'm working on this on a regular basis and I'm thinking about this all of the time. And so therefore our brain reinforces those connections. Even on the days when you don't have a chance, somebody's commenting here, you must write every I was day, just about five days a week. Yeah. There, there's actually no solid rule like that. It's just, you must write. You might, mm -hmm. I, I write seven days a week. I've hit every single day so far this year, which is great for me, but I haven't done that any year before this. So this is just something I've been doing this year. Um, I, I, I personally do during the week, you know, Monday through Friday, and then I I take a four hour block on Saturday or Sunday where it's no one knocks on the door, everyone leaves mommy alone. I put in my headphones and I just I power through. But it's it's like you said, you must write. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know some people who only write on the weekends. I know other people who only write on weekdays and they take every weekend off. How you end up choosing to do it is up to you and how, and it's probably gonna change. So be ready for that too. You know, what, what worked for you this year may not work for you five years from now. We change over time and so our processes will as well. But you must write. And even on the days or times when you're not writing, think about the writing because that's still reinforcing those neuronal connections and helping us to, to, to build on that. All right, so you must write is pretty simple. It still takes out 90% of people who, are, who wanna write a book. And then the second rule takes out 90% of the remaining group. So I mean, if you manage to make the first two rules, you're in the top 1% already. And that, this rule is you must finish what you write. You must finish what you start. I can't tell you how many writers I have seen who write a book and then they revise it and then they revise it again and then they revise it again and again. And I've seen people do 16, 20 revisions and they've been working on the same book that they wrote 10 years ago and they're still trying to work on cleaning it up and stuff. They've never finished. Even though the book itself, all of the text is there they still haven't actually done the pro done the letting go process and released it out into the world, either sent it to, to a publisher or independently published it themselves, however that they want to, you want to do it. That's rule number four. <laughs> um, but you have to actually finish it. And that means sticking with a book, even when it's gotten into the saggy middle and you're like, this is the worst book ever. I'm doing a terrible job pushing forward keep pushing forward even on the days when you feel bad keep pushing forward even on the, the the times when the book feels awful keep driving ahead and, and finish finish writing the book and then finish whatever post-process work you opt to do and then move on from there to the next book because the way we improve at writing fastest is by writing new words it's not by revision it's not by editing it's not by reading other people's works, although all of those things can help. The fastest way to improve our, our skills in this craft is by actually doing the work, sitting down at the keyboard or dictation device or whatever we're using these days and, and, and making the words happen and then finishing the story. All right, rule number three. This is the most controversial of all of Heinlein's five rules. People either love it or they hate and it. And I've already broken it. <laughs> you must not revise, rewrite, except to editorial order. This flies in the face of a good solid chunk of writing advice out there. And it, it, the 
we're told, uh, get down the sloppy first draft. You can fix it later. Writing is rewriting. All of the rest of the stuff. Ironically, do you know who said uh, writing is re rewriting? Who? Uh, that was, um, uh, what's his name? Old Man in the Sea. Um, I'm blanking on his name now. <laughs> Famous author, uh, <laughs> Hemingway, there we go. Uh, Hemingway said that, if I remember right, and the ironic thing is that Hemingway was usually a one draft writer. <laughs> he didn't revise and rewrite. Most authors of his era didn't because they were writing on manual typewriters. And if you made more than a few corrections per page, you had to go and retype the entire page, which was a pain in the neck. So writers, uh, I, I got my start on a manual typewriter and I can speak from experience. It's a pain in the neck. You don't want to do it. So writers got to practice. <laughs> writers got a lot of practice at, at writing very clean first drafts. They, uh, we, because I feel like I said, that's where I got my start when I was younger. Um, we didn't want to do revisions. We didn't want to do rewrites. So we tried to write things as well as humanly possible. Um, there was one science fiction author I heard about who used to write short stories in the front window of a bookstore. And as he finished typing up each page, he would rip out the page and have it posted up on the window of the bookstore. Wow. So cool. Now, we have some people today who do that. They, they uh, put up, they live stream their, their writing progress. They, they live stream the, their words as they're creating them. And, and nobody wants to do sloppy work for that. Yeah. So when I started working on these rules, I set out on a process of, 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 of trying to improve to the point where I could effectively do it. And it took me about a million words or so to really get good at this. And now my, my drafts, my first drafts are better than 99% identical to my finished final copy. And that, is a skill that I find is really worth earning, but does take mm -hmm. some time to practice. Um, it means I don't I don't have to do revisions. I don't have to do uh, cleanup work, aside from just basically typo correction and the occasional spelling or grammar error or something. Um, that's the only problems that the that my editor has to pick out at this point. But even before that, if you if we are, are sitting down at our keyboard and we are doing our absolute best work, if we're not doing a sloppy first draft, if we are just pushing ourselves to write as well as we can, then what usually, and again, these are anything about writing is general folks. So, you know, like, please don't ever take anything I say here as being the only way. There's no one true way to write. And there's no one true way to publish. Um, but what I found is that when we sit down to do the very best job that we possibly can, most of the time we end up with a draft that we literally cannot improve ourselves, at least not very much. And so a second set of eyes is preferable to playing with it ourselves. Because uh, if I take a draft that I've pushed myself to do as well as I possibly could on the first draft. And then I start poking it over myself. I'm gonna make changes. I'll see some things that, are, that, are, that I'll wanna change, but they're not necessarily gonna improve the story any. They're not necessarily yeah. gonna make it any better. I'm just moving the chairs around on the, on the, on the, the ship's deck. <laughs> I'm not actually making anything new there. I'm not actually improving it. Yeah. But getting a second set of eyes on definitely can. So for the novice writer, having a developmental editor look at it and say, hey, you you have these plot points dangling with no resolution, or you know, hey, you missed this piece here and you should probably work on fleshing this out. Uh, whatever the comments the developmental editor might make, those could be incredibly valuable to the newer writer. Uh, a line editor uh, focuses on doing things with language, restructuring sentences so that they sound better, restructuring paragraphs so that they flow better, uh, making the, the prose better. Um, and, and they do a bunch of other stuff too. But again, these are skills that most novice writers, which in writing and publishing is usually considered the first million published word. That's your apprenticeship period. So while you're in that apprenticeship period, 
every single book is giving you enormous gains in skill and everything you can do to improve those gains is a massive asset. Having a good developmental edit or a good line edit or both uh, during those, those early phases um, can be enormously valuable because all of the lessons that you learn will work for all of your future books too, not just this book, because your next first draft will get better. And that's something that's important. People don't always catch that he didn't say never revise. He said, don't revise except to editorial order. He's saying, yeah. get a different set of eyes on your story. Because if you have done your very best work right from the get-go, if you have created the best possible story that you can in your first draft, then assuming you were successful at that, you probably can't improve it. You can't make it any better yourself. So getting that second set of eyes, or at least it's going to be very difficult to. So getting that second and set that of eyes helps. That's what we touched on in our last session. The revision that I made, I had actually a couple of, of set of eyes on the story and, and uh, just with the multicast of first person perspectives, it was, it was just a little bit too confusing to jump back and forth from 20 different character perspectives in first person. And that was my major revision was changing it from first person to third person, which made it clearer. So that would be more of an editorial revision versus just me playing in the playground and never leaving it. Yeah, and, and if we're experimenting with something new, sometimes we can tell right away if it's not if it's not working, and that's fine. Um, but if we're if we're just writing the next book, it can be really hard to spot the things that we've done that that worked for us but aren't going to work as well for the reader. And the way we grow is by learning where those holes are. I, I can't tell you how many different things an editor's pointed out to me that I've done wrong in my in my uh, sentence structure. One of my favorites for years was using the same word twice or more than twice in back-to-back -back sentences too mm -hmm. much. I got rid of most of that now, <laughs> but it took some work. And it took having it pointed out to me by somebody else for me to be able to see it. If rule number one and two take out 99% of writers, um, rule three is problematic because it, it, it doesn't tend to take writers out of the equation, it slows us down if we're not following it. Uh, that, that writer, I just was talking to somebody recently who was finishing their 16th draft of a book. And, and, and that could have been 16 books or at least maybe like eight books. Um, I've got a lot of books I want to write. And I, I, I want to do, I, ideally, I really want to do hundreds more over the course of my career. I would never be able to do that if I was spending tons and tons of time on, on e going over each one over and over again. So doing, doing a, an excellent first draft, practicing, at an excellent first draft, because it doesn't happen overnight, uh, is, is an, excep an exceptionally valuable tool for the professional writer. For the, the part-timer, it's not as important, but if this is something you wanna do as a career, which is where Heinlein's rules were geared, then it's really important. Um, rule number four, you must put the book on the market. You must put the story, the book, whatever it is, on the market. Um, if, if, if you want to be, a, this one's sort of a, a, a no-brainer. If you want to have, you know, if you want to be a professional writer, you have to put your books places where readers can get them. And these days, that might be, it might be indie publishing, or it might be submitting it to publishers or agents. Whatever path you decide to choose, put it, put it out there, you know, get it out there. And then rule number five is inextricably linked to that, and that is keep it on the market until it sells. Now, for Heinlein's era, what he was talking about was send it back out to somebody else. It doesn't matter if you've had 50 rejections, there's a 51st person out there, send it. Keep sending it out over and over. 
uh, again, mentioning Dean. Uh, Dean Wesley Smith had a group of writers early in his career where they had a game and, and everyone got points for finishing stories, I think, if I remember right. But they also, the important part was they got points for submitting them. And they got points for getting an acceptance, but they got points just for submitting a story. And so the object of the game was to, as soon as you got a rejection letter back, you sent the story back out to another market and you got points for it. And, and <laughs> they were, as a result, these writers were getting practice at constantly cycling through. Uh, cycling through one market after another, trying to get those stories out. They didn't let the story sit still. The story came in, the story went right back out again to the next next market on the list. And um, for, uh, everyone knows that JK Rowling had like six zillion uh, different publishers refuse to pick up her book before she finally got the Harry Potter books published. Uh, she's not alone. She's the, you know, like, the story that everybody tells, but lots of lots of writers have had that experience. So if you're trying to do traditional publishing and you, you want to make it work, you've got to keep on going. That doesn't mean you set aside your writing because while the stories are out there, you're still working on the next book. And it might be the next book in the series. It might be a new series entirely. It might be a new standalone, whatever the case, you're still working on another, another story constantly. That's really not letting those rejections get you down and, and just turn you off your craft is such an important thing. Really? I, I went through that where, you know, I had gotten some rejections and it was just so disheartening. And then I got some of those pay to publish the, the, what do they call it? Subsidy vanity. Press. Yes. Yeah. The vanity press. I've gotten multiple of those and it was just so disheartening that you know for a while i just kind of put book two on the back shelf because i was just so down and i finally had to just you know jump back in take control and and now i'm pushing forward yeah when i was a teenager and i was trying to do my first submissions to places i had a, a i i did the the stephen king thing I, I had a nail on the wall and i would put them all up on top of the the, the nail <laughs> i actually hadn't read on writing yet but uh, you know, for for self publishers, it's a little bit different. Somebody's saying self publishing was a eureka moment. It sure was for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, for self publishing is obviously a little bit different. But even there, there's still a market, and you have to have the books on the market to sell. Now, um, some writers will take that to mean, well, I want to have my book in all of the markets, so they'll go wide. Other people will be like, well, most of my readers are in Kindle Unlimited or even half my readers are in Kindle Unlimited. So I'm gonna go into Kindle Unlimited, go where your readers are. There's lots, there's there's no one <laughs> no one sure way to do any of this, right? So, no, there's not. Uh, go where your readers are, put the book on the marketplace and then leave it there. Continue doing more promotion for it, continue uh, you know, occasionally popping it back up with, with a little bit of, of marketing, but put the book up and then leave it there. It doesn't really matter if it sells really well. It might sell much better someday. I had a book that I launched in 2012 that hit the USA Today bestseller list in 2016. So there is wow. no way, yeah, there, there's there's no way of knowing. Oh, and now it's that, that I'm doing, I did a recover on that, on that series and now it's making me a bunch of money again. You know, um, there's no time limit on this stuff. It doesn't expire. It doesn't go bad. It's not produce, so we can continue. Um, we can con we can continue making income from all of these stories forever. We just have to keep them on the market, and if the markets change, then we change with it. If the markets ad ad adapt, we might want to um, we might want to uh, switch to the different retailers that we're publishing with. If the uh, if we're maybe getting out of writing, but we still want to have somebody playing with our stuff, maybe sell the rights to a publisher, uh, a small press or something that wants to pick up the, the rights and continue managing the books for us. There's lots of different opportunities and options. And the ones that are going to work for any given writer are specific to them. But keep your, keep, keep your eyes open and keep adapting and changing with whatever the, time, you know, whatever the times demand. 
We have a comment about rule two finish does not work well for me. Sometimes they don't deserve being finished, but parts may be useful in other books. I never trash failed work. I consider them treasure. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I can't speak for Heinlein because um, I'm not him. I suspect he would say that that is violating that rule. Um, that doesn't mean that you're never going to make it as a writer. Plenty of people have <laughs> done just fine without following any of, well, without following most of these rules. Um, I find that finishing a work is really important because it encourages me to get past the point in a book where I want to give up on it. And that was especially some, that was something I especially dealt with during my early, my earlier books. Uh, there would inevitably be a time where I was like, this book is not good. I don't like it. I want to write something else. I've got this wonderful story idea sitting in the back of my head and it wants to come out. I, that still happens. <laughs> I'm still like, but I need to be writing this story, but I want to write this new one over here. You know, like you got to watch out for the, 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 the shiny stuff. I, I'm not saying yeah. every, so, go ahead, Christina. Sorry. Oh no, I was, I was, I, I have that problem too. I have probably about 15 like part written stories. Now there's one I'm going to have to completely abandon that I wrote um, about a year and a half ago and I got like the first chapter in and then my husband was deployed at the time. So writing was super back burner, but it was about a Chinese flu that sent the world into a post-apocalyptic <laughs> society, which, I wrote this like oh. a year and a half ago. So obviously I, I kind of, my, my story got stolen a little bit of the pandemic. Yeah, that one, that one might be a, a little bit too close to home for people right now, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna leave it in the folder. Um, yeah, it's, I have, I have works that I haven't finished. I have, um, a series that was originally planned to be a trilogy that I've never written book three for, and I don't know that I ever actually will, because the first two books, although they got good reviews, uh, uh, didn't get a lot of sales. Apparently, uh, King Arthur, historical King Arthur, and a, a zombie outbreak was not peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> Um, I thought it sounded good, but apparently it didn't really work too well, work too well for people. Uh, so Andrea I, wants to know how you deal with those self reject demons. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, uh, of taking a leap of faith. Um, there's been days when I do not want to write, but I don't want to break my streak either. And I, I want to hit my, my, my goal for the month in terms of my word count. And so, you know, like there's, there's sometimes where I, I'm literally just plowing ahead and I have to take a leap of faith that yes, this really is just as good as the last book I wrote. And it turns out that it's right. So at this point where I'm at now, it's actually a little easier than it once was because I've had so many books work. I've had that happen so many times where I'm like part way through the book. I'm like, I just want to do something different, anything different, because <laughs> this is, I, I'm just not feeling it right now. Um, so at, at this point I've had that happen so many times and stuff with the book succeed that I can sort of be like, okay, you've done this before. One thing that I've noticed and I found this, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say it circles back to, to what you said about, you know, practicing your craft. You've had so much practice and having that self-doubt, having overcoming that self-doubt and then seeing yourself succeed. It's the biggest part of being a writer is is continually working on and practicing your craft. Mm -hmm. um, have some faith in yourself. Uh, that, that's that's I guess what I can say to this here is is. is one thing I've noticed from a, talking to a lot of different writers about these sorts of feelings is that the writing that we do when we don't feel like writing 
and the writing that we do when it feels like the words are just dripping from our fingers and we're creating flawless prose, the reader can't tell the difference. So at least for most writers and most readers, this is, this is something I've seen with great consistency. Readers don't know. Readers don't know that this book was a struggle. Readers don't know that chapter 24 through, through 30 were just a, a monstrosity and you were sick with the flu and uh, barely managed to get them done. Readers have no idea because the quality actually doesn't really change. <laughs> I've had books that I, I, I wrote where I'm typing I had one book I wrote where I, I typed the second half of it straight at about 3,000 words per hour. I, I was type, I usually do not type that fast. Um, and I've, you know, the, the book was, was solid. Even though I was typing really, really fast, I wasn't making more typos or problems or dropping plots or anything else. And I've had books where it was an absolute struggle to get each chapter done. One thing that I do sometimes in order to assist with this a little bit is I, I will sometimes work on multiple works at the same time. Um, I have a science fiction book that I'm writing and I have um, a book I'm plotting uh, that Michael Anderley and I will be writing. Um, so I can work on the plotting or I can on the, the urban fantasy book, or I can work on you know, like the beats, beat writing basically. Um, I'm writing 10,000 words and that is gonna get fleshed out into a novel sort of thing. Um, yeah. and, and, or I can work on the science fiction book or if I if I want to, I can pop over and work on a, a nonfiction book. Um, I, right now I'm working on a nonfiction book for the Five Pillars of Publishing, which is the, the talk I gave yesterday. Um, and, and so I, 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 I kind of mix it up a little bit and that way if I'm feeling really stymied with something, I can put it on the back burner, switch gears to something else and still get, um, still get productive work done. Yeah. But I have to be careful of doing that. That's, you know, I have to do it with caution because I have to be cognizant of deadlines too. And if I've I was going to say, I just lost count of how many projects. <laughs> If I've gone and meandered off on some other project, instead of taking care of the one that's due this at the end of the week, I'm going to be in trouble. And I've had that happen a few times too. So it's not the end of the world, but it does. Do you have but, some giant board up on your wall that tells you when things have to be done? No, I actually have a rocket book. Uh, I have uh, one of the little rewritable rocket books. I, I, I have it right on my desk right now because I was taking, I, I wrote down notes for the panel I was on previously, uh, questions and stuff, but it, it's one of these infinitely rewritable uh, notebooks. Um, and uh, I, I just jot down my deadlines and my dates and my time frames and stuff on there. And it seems to work pretty well right now. I have used a board. I have stuck a, a a 12 week calendar thing to my desk with lamination. Um, I, I've done all sorts of things. And I think it's really, I think it's really okay to experiment as you're going along. I think it's okay to try new things. I'm mostly a pantser folks. And um, I'm using the, the plotter software right now and playing with that because I, I wanna try out new things constantly. It, it's always good to be growing and learning. So what's it called if you're, you know, you're a, uh... You're a half pantser, but you kind of have like a sketchy, like one or two sentence per chapter outline. You know, you sort of know where you're going, but you're waiting to see kind of. Most people what's that? fall on the spectrum. Some people what? write. Some people write nothing. They have no concept of the story and nothing about it whatsoever when they start when they sit down to write. That would be pure discovery writing. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have the people who write uh, a novella before they write their, their novel. Um, you know, they write a novella plot outline and then they flesh that out into a novel. And um, and, and um, that's that, that's fine too. That would be extreme plotting. But most people fall in somewhere on the spectrum between the two extremes, I find. And, and really, there's no wrong answer here. Um, the only thing I could suggest is, is trying out all of the different things. Uh, if you're a pan if you're a, a pantser, try plotting the next book. If you're a plotter, try doing some discovery writing. Change it up a little bit, and um, you can you know really make things. You can really learn a lot from that experience. 
Okay, um, I wanted to save some time here for, for questions because mm -hmm. I know that there's usually a, a, a lot of questions around, especially rule number three, but around the, the Highlands rules in general. So um, folks who have uh, questions, we've got about 15 minutes left in the session. I can continue talking forever, um, but I wanted to save enough time to answer uh, key questions if people have them. So please uh, sound off, feel free. Um, I have multiple monitors here with every every stream available, so I'm catching the questions everywhere. Thank you. Yeah, and Lawrence commented really early on that he's doing a panel on the third rule. So, you know, like Lawrence, if you if you have any questions, now's the time. We have someone saying in Discord that uh, Heinlein's rules are still valid today. I think Highlands rules are still valid today. Um, they've changed in tone a little bit because we're no longer submitting works and keeping them and continuously submitting them over and over until they're accepted. So rules four and five have changed a little bit. In this case, it, you know, in, in the indie world, the the putting it on the market is, is publishing it and keeping it on the market is, is adapting to whatever changing marketplaces happen. Uh, maybe you want to set off your website now. You know, maybe you want to do, I'm trying Patreon with a new series right now. Um, I've got a Patreon up for Titan Online, which is a science fiction lit RPG series. Um, and, and it's good to try out other things and to expand your market presence any way you possibly can. So that's how I would register rule five. But I think that the, we're a lot. We're in a lot. We're in a very similar situation to where they were in the 1920s, 30s, 40s for in terms of writing. Um, the world back then was one where if you were a good writer, you could write a story and pub, it would almost certainly be published. Um, some of these writers wrote, up, you know, a thousand or more individual works between short stories and longer fiction. Uh, that, that's astounding. Uh, by 1980s and 1990s standards, that's you know incredible. But uh, the the writers of that era wrote a lot. They wrote a lot of words on their little manual typewriters. Mm -hmm. And our tools are better today. Our publishing system is just as open and free. We can write and publish everything we want to, if we want. We have a couple of um, questions. So Anthea asked if you write and sell a lot of short fiction. I write, <clears throat> define short. <laughs> um, so my natural writing length seems to be roughly 40,000 words plus or minus 10,000. Um, I, I, I have a tendency to write very short novels and really, you know, novellas too. Uh, novellas are short novels. And I, um, I, 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 I do write shorter stuff than that sometimes. And I'm working on learning to write longer books right now. <laughs> um, the, the Steel Dragon monstrosities uh, it were reverse omnibuses. So they were almost 200,000 words each, um, but they were you know, a set of 60 to 70,000 word books. Uh, of the three, three of those. And the Dragon's Daughter books I'm doing with Michael are 80,000 words each, roughly. So we're, um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing longer than I used to. I, I, I went back and expanded some novellas into novel length um, by adding some additional content and context to the stories. Um, but I, I like writing, I like writing different lengths. And I find that that 40 to 50,000 words is probably my favorite spot even though it's not reader's favorite spot. There's right now, there's a definite tendency toward longer works doing slightly better and holding their rank and visibility a little bit better. We have another um, an observation. Highlands rules are a lot easier to follow if you've already put your first million words, put in your first million words and have built up some unconscious knowledge of storytelling. That's very true, but they're also important if you, if I had been doing, trying to follow Heinlein rules, if I had been working in that direction from the very start, I think I would have progressed much more rapidly. Um, because I came into it a little bit later and then and, 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 and didn't jump in with both feet right away when I did, 
I didn't, I, I didn't, I, I missed some some time that would have been been valuable. I missed some some um, some. I slowed my progress down more than I I, I would have liked, I guess. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's really helpful once you you know especially helpful once you've got the the. But there's also something to be said for uh, trying it from the beginning. Because then you have you're building toward that level of experience where those rules can start fully functioning for you, even if you're not doing it perfectly right from the get go. Keeping the the rules in mind as something that you are working toward as an aspira aspiration, as a goal, um, that's really you know I, I think a worthwhile path for a novice to follow today. I I really like that. Uh, Anthea goes on to ask, how long do you keep a story on submission to a traditional magazine markets before you pull it to self-publish or use for your own newsletter, newsletter or, yeah. or Patreon? Yeah. Um, I don't submit to traditional markets anymore. I, I stopped doing that a long time ago because they're, they're, the markets are, uh, are overfill don't pay very well most of them and um and, and um they're not really offering me all that much i probably should do more of that it's certainly still a valid path and i mean the the for me though what i usually do is i wait is i either wait until i get an invite to an anthology or i <laughs> i um uh, hear about an anthology and say hey would you like one of my you know one of my stories uh there, there's one case, Craig, one of Craig's uh, anthologies I hadn't entered into, and he was uh, complaining to me that a couple of the people who had he'd accepted weren't done with their stories. He they, he'd accepted it based on the first 500 words, and uh, you know, like they, they they didn't finish the story. So I'm like, well, um, if you can wait until tomorrow, I can give you a story. So I sat down and I wrote a story that night, and I turned it into one the next day. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, short stories are really easy for me to write. Uh, you know, if I'm writing four or five thousand words, it's only a, a few hours work, um, and um, I, I, I like doing them sometimes. So I, I have fun with entering into an anthology, and then the story that I use in the anthology, I will frequently use in some other way afterwards. Uh, one of them became the nucleus for a novel. Uh, the three I published with Craig are, are themselves the nucleus for another novel that I would write at some point down, down the road. Um, uh, a couple of them I've gone on to use as reader magnets for newsletter signups. I've got a, a bunch of those uh, short stories. I we have a couple of comments about uh, indie. Indie seems to be the way to go from the last two years and traditional publishing hurt Charlie by holding up three works that made good money in indie. Hmm. Um, I was at Mark Dawson's SPF Live event in London at the beginning of the of 2020, and and one of the things that stuck out for me. Oh no, I I, I take it back. This was this was either talk he gave there or it was a talk at 20 Books the year before, but wh whichever it was, he's. He actually pointed out that basically traditional publishing is the new vanity publishing. It's the new vanity press. And, and that sounds incendiary, and, and, and it can be, but bear with me for a second. Um, <laughs> it's not saying it's bad because we're used to thinking vanity bad, vanity press bad. And that the old the old school vanity presses, the subsidy presses and stuff, they're, they're, they're really bad news. Avoid them like a plague. But um, the main reason why most people choose to do traditional publishing at this point is for validation. They do not feel confident in their ability to write a story. They do not feel like they are, are, are a good enough writer like until somebody's told them that they are. And, and that's totally okay. That's just a person's personality. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so if you are choosing to do traditional publishing because you want to see a book of yours in a Barnes and Nobles, I, I did that once. <laughs> it was fun. I could, I, you know, I, I completely admit, you know, like uh, I had a nonfiction book that I co-wrote with somebody through, it was published through Wordware, a Magic the Gathering book back in the nineties. 
And um, we were both in the pro tour together. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, so it's fun to have your books in bookstores. It's fun. It's neat. And, and if that's something that you want to do, then, then go ahead and do it. Um, if you want the validation of having somebody else put their seal of approval on your work and say, yes, this person is good enough. If that makes you feel better, if that makes you feel more complete, um, if that's what's going to make you happy, do it. Um, if you want to make a living, you probably want to go indie, or at least some form of hybrid. Um, I'm hybrid yeah. at this point because I'm publishing my own books and I'm also publishing stuff with Michael through LMVPN, which even though they're sort of an indie small press, they're also the largest in terms of uh, titles per year. They're the largest publisher of science fiction and fantasy books in the world. Wow. Um, so does that count as, 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 as indie or does that count? I, I figure that's basically trad at this point. It's just trad who happens to offer a really good deal. Um, I'm looking into a deal potentially with another publisher next year as well for a trilogy. And so I have no problems with going to a traditional publisher. I'm not going to write a book and send it off to them and wait two years, hoping that maybe they'll, they'll like it though. I'm going to sit down and talk with the publisher first and say, Hey, I'd like to work with you. Do you want to work with me? Yes. Good. Here's my story idea. Would you like to see the, you know, see the three novels written for the story? And if they say yes, then I'll write the novels. And if they say no, then I'm going to write something else. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not there. I haven't, I submitted something to Orbit um, uh, like four or five years ago. That was the last thing that I submitted to a traditional publisher in, in that manner. And I would, I don't see myself ever doing it again. Um, I think that the sooner authors can get away from that, even if they're stuck in that in that mode at the beginning, the sooner that you can get away from that by building contacts and connections in the industry, by by getting to know the people who own Mountain Vale or Athon or LMBPN, and getting to talk to some of the, the people. Mm -hmm. These are all the up and coming uh, publishers of the future. The the, yeah. the Orbit and Tor and Bayon and all the rest of these the, these folks out there, they were once little tiny operations too, and then they grew. And um, the the small operations that you see being run by a couple of people um, will grow into LMBPNs where they have you know dozens of staff, and then we'll grow from there into some of them into places like Tor or Orbit, who have you know like big big things. So um, yeah make those connections because the connections last. Well, I think that we are almost out of time. If you want to tell everyone where we can find you on the, uh, the internet and where we can find your books. Yeah. Um, you can find me at Kevin O Um, and the, I do not update my website as much as I should, but if you would like, I was there yesterday. <laughs> There is a, a, a short story, a science fiction short story that I particularly love that's up there as a freebie right now. Um, you do give me your email address, <laughs> and I promise to take very, very good care of it if you do, and you can always unsubscribe right after you get the story if you want. But this one is called Ghost, uh, Ghost of an Opportunity, and it's, the, uh, it's, it's a, a little ode to the, uh, the lost drone on Mars that I, uh, you know, that we, yeah, uh, I wrote it right after I heard about the the last words. It's you know, it, it's cold and it's getting dark, <laughs> and I was like, um, "I downloaded it okay, yesterday. I got to write a story about this." So uh, I I really love that story, and I hope you will too. And if you want to hear more about Heinlein's rules, um, you know, uh, Dean has written some excellent articles about it on his website. Or like I said, you can um, pick up the book. You must write, um, and you can read some more about it there. This was a, a very informative panel, and I'm, I'm so glad that you let me come on here with you. Oh, thank you so much. You. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We uh, <laughs> hope that you enjoyed. We're, we're wrapping up. We're coming, coming to the end of the close. We hope you've enjoyed CIFCON so far and stick around for the last couple of panels. Yeah, this has been great. So thanks, everybody. Take care. All right. Bye.